Hello and welcome to Simon TV. Uh, this is my first time doing a piece to camera with the new setup, so I hope you'll bear with me. I have notes and a script outline, so I'm going to half read and half ad lib what I'm about to say. I'm also operating all of the knobs and dials, so please bear with me. Uh, the subject today is Auckland University. Auckland University is vociferously opposed to free speech and open academic inquiry. In a moment, I'm going to play you a leaked recording of a lecture delivered on campus two weeks ago, demonstrating that, but first allow me to set the background. In its eagerness to embrace Marxist critical theory and inter intersectionality theory, and the diversity, equity and inclusion policies that go along with all of that, the university abandoned the Enlightenment principles of logic, reason, critical thinking, empirical evidence, and open inquiry some years ago. Universities once presented multiple perspectives. Today, students are presented with a single perspective, and they're expected to merely regurgitate it. No argument is tolerated. Students and faculty members at Auckland University who question the prevailing orthodoxy face academic censure or worse. This was epitomised three years ago by the so-called Listener 7 uh, scandal. Seven academics who had the temerity to observe that the superstitious beliefs of a Stone Age culture do not qualify as science. These academics were pilloried in New Zealand and, at the behest of Auckland University, their own university, an inquiry was launched against them under the auspices of the Royal Society, at least the New Zealand chapter of the Royal Society. It amounted to little more than an ideological struggle session. Auckland University Chancellor, Vice Chancellor rather, Dawn Freshwater, said at the time that the seven had caused considerable hurt and dismay among our staff, students and alumni. Empirical facts cause hurt, according to the Vice-Chancellor, and they will not be tolerated. The pogrom Auckland University conducted into its academics elicited outrage in the international scientific community, with even luminaries such as Richard Dawkins expressing dismay. But far from being embarrassed or chastened by the international response, Auckland University doubled down on its attacks upon free speech and open inquiry. One example of this ideological zealotry is the Disinformation Project. It's a far-left pseudo-academic academic, organisation hosted by Auckland University. It was established by Jacinda Ardern to suppress criticism of her regime and its policies, financed, of course, by taxpayers. If you haven't heard of the Disinformation Project, it's the organisation that says Instagram videos featuring blonde children with braided hair a far-right propaganda that should be banned from the internet. This is not an exaggeration. They seriously do say this. Another example is the university's so-called infodemic project led by the vice-chancellor herself. Get this, it was initially established to dispute that the COVID-19 virus originated in China. This project spends public money tracking social media users who dispute left-wing ideology and proposes methods of suppressing their opinions. This is what Auckland University chooses to spend public money on instead of research and teaching. Fortunately, it's not all bad news. Another consequence of Auckland University's far-left extremism was to elicit a political response, with New Zealand's Libertarian Act Party proposing legislation to defund institutions who don't support free speech and academic freedom. Auckland University, University is vociferously opposed to that too, of course, and in an effort to, to avoid parliamentary oversight, last week the university released a draft of their so-called Freedom of Expression and Academic Policy, which pays, as I'm sure you can imagine, mere lip service to these principles. The section concerning um, visitors speaking at the university attracted the attention of the Free Speech Union and various commentators, and mine. Auckland University proposes not to permit visitors whose speech 
involves the advancement of theories or propositions which fall below scholarly standards to such an extent as to be detrimental to the university's character and its performance of the functions characteristic of a university. Ladies and gentlemen, the clip I'm about to play for you was a lecture delivered by a guest speaker on the 22nd of May, 2024. While a visitor for this particular course, he is in fact a member of the university faculty. He's also had a decades-long career as a journalist, starting out at that bastion of truth and balance television New Zealand, and progressing through the various far-left media organisations one would expect. The students who leaked this recording were too frightened by the threat of repercussions to object during this lecture or to raise their concerns subsequently. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to do it for them. You're about to hear what Auckland University considers, to use their term, acceptable scholarly standards. So what I want to talk about now is what I see as in many ways the turning point of, of, the, uh, of the second Ardern government and which eventually led to, I think, probably was a large uh, contributor to her resignation and not going through to, to leading the, the Labour Party in the, in the 2023 election. Leftists in New Zealand are particularly sensitive to any criticism of Jacinda Ardern. To them, her regime was in no way autocratic, nor did it devastate the New Zealand economy with hundreds of billions of debt through poor spending, nor did she divide our society with anti-democratic policies. And most crucially, nothing she and her acolytes ever said was in any way untrue. To them, Ardern is, to use her own words, the single source of truth. A princess who used neo-kindness to, to deliver New Zealand into a socialist nirvana, or she would have if only that pesky concept of democracy hadn't got in her way. It was the occupation of Parliament by the anti-vax or anti-vax mandate protesters, which obviously ended very, very violently, as you see in these images. And what happened with that, quite apart from turning a lot of people against, against the, the government, because, you know, quite frankly, they completely mishandled it. And my personal opinion, they should have just cleared them out on the first day, because, yes, you definitely have a right to protest and, and protest in Parliament grounds, you do not have a right to set up an encampment in, in, in Parliament's grounds. And as it grew and, and, and meant more disruption for the people... Occupation is an established tactic in New Zealand political protest. Ihamatu in South Auckland during the Ardern regime was occupied for months. Bastion Point back in the day was occupied for almost two years. Despite this lecturer's unfounded assertion, the right to occupy during political demonstrations is not prohibited by New Zealand law, or at least the interpretation of it. People who lived in central Wellington meant it was in increasingly difficult for the police to get those people out, and when it happened, it was, it was incredibly violent. Um, you know, I have a personal experience of this because my, my brother's stepson was actually one of the people who was throwing things at the police. I wonder if perhaps an unhappy home life was a contributing factor to subsequent regrettable behaviour. Um, and he, he actually got off charges of throwing a concrete block at the police because, in my opinion, quite understandably, understandably the police were quite rough in arresting him. And the judge said, oh, poor you, um, you know, you should be let off. Well, he's a six foot four ex rugby prop who threw a concrete block at the police. I'm not surprised that the cops actually you know, dealt to him. But anyway, that's just a, a little personal anecdote about it. I wonder if this lecturer supports violent suppression of left-wing demonstrations by the state as well, or just the demonstration he disapproves of. I expect he doesn't. There were some very bad people involved in the occupation of Parliament. Um, and what was quite alarming about it is they were motivated by some very nasty online sites um, it was disinformation and misinformation. Okay. Outside the socialist nirvana of Auckland University, it's a widely accepted fact that the Ardern regime regularly infringed upon Kiwi civil rights. In fact, David Parker, who served as Attorney General in the Ardern regime, admitted as such 
when he accepted the High Court's decision of August 2020. Mr Parker stated that the court did find that there was a breach of the Bill of Rights Act in the first nine days of the Alert Level 4 lockdown. This lecturer refrains from mentioning to students that a senior figure in the regime he is devoted to totally rebuts his fallacious argument. Um, so you had what I regard now as the mainstream uh, social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, um, uh, Instagram, YouTube, but there are these smaller ones, the fringe sites like Telegram, Rumble, obviously Gab and Getter, um, and these were the ones that were really racking people up and saying that, that you know, Jab Cinder was a dictator and, and your rights have been trampled upon, which was total crap. So it's misinformation and disinformation. Now, there's an important difference between misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation is false information that was not created with, you know, it's just crap. It was not created with the intent to harm people. But disinformation is, intent, is, is intended to harm a person, community, or organisation. It's helpful if you remember that when left-wing extremists use the terms misinformation and disinformation, what they actually mean is dissent. And increasingly, there is, in that sphere, there's more disinformation than there, was, there is misinformation. So, as you can see with these figures, this, the, the, the disinformation on the fringe sites, both the fringe sites and the mainstream sites, just took off. Um, so, uh, Telegram, um, just huge increase, Facebook as well. Um, one of the biggest disinformation uh, disseminators is Chantal Baker, whose father is Leighton Baker, who was leader of the, new, of the Conservative and then the New Conservative Party, and then that split off again and he stood as the Leighton Baker Party in the last election. Um, the, the, all these little parties on the right, just tend, they're like the left parties last century, they just continually splinter. Um, but Chantal Baker puts up some very poisonous stuff, particularly um, at the time of the Parliament uh, occupation, um, attacking Jacinda Ardern. Okay, blimey. For those unfamiliar with Chantal Baker, she's a social commentator who developed quite a following during the COVID lockdowns for offering critique of government policy. This lecturer states that she puts up some very poisonous stuff and disseminate, disseminated disinformation with the deliberate intent to harm people, a community, or an organization. This is a startling allegation to make, and please note, he does not provide any evidence to support this assertion. I was here for Wayne Brown, and uh, I, you know, he was very entertaining. I'm, I'm not gonna try and rise to his level of entertainment, but I've gotta say that on two, two particular respects, he is totally full of shit. <laughs> the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I, 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 I majored uh, both in, in my BA and MA in politics and Russian. So I speak Russian, I've visited Russia many times. This is argumentum ab auctoritate, the, the logical fallacy of argument from a authority. According to this lecturer, his opinions are statements of fact that are beyond question. Because he studied politics and the Russian language once upon a time, he isn't required to support his opinions with arguments or evidence. The Russians and the Ukrainians are, are different people, they speak different languages, it is not a civil war. 30% of the Ukrainian population that is Russian speaking would tend to disagree with the assertion that the Ukrainian conflict is not a civil war. Unsurprisingly, this lecturer refrains from presenting their perspective to the, to the students attending the class. And that war is very important for democracies all across the world because it is a near totalitarian dictatorship led by Vladimir Putin that is trying to rub out a demo vibrant democracy. A countervailing perspective might be that the Russian Federation is intervening in a civil war on behalf of a minority oppressed by a Western-backed regime committed to NATO expansion. Once again, this perspective does not fit the Auckland University narrative, and this lecturer refrains from presenting it to the students in his class. It has its problems, a lot of corruption, but it's trying to rub out a vibrant, vibrant democracy in. Just as an aside, he also refrains from mentioning the American-backed coup d'etat against the democratically elected government 
during the Maidan Revolution of 2014. American guarantees concerning eastward expansion of NATO in 1990. And the seminal work in this field, uh, Brzezinski, Brzezinski's rather The Grand Chessboard, American Primacy and its Geostrategic Imperative. Each of these topics are extremely relevant to a discussion of the Ukrainian conflict. Yet this lecturer refrains from mentioning them to the students attending the class. In Ukraine, and that has implications all across the world. So I am totally at odds with one main brown on that. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Um, quite apart from the fact he's clearly a narcissistic uh, person. But anyway, that's... Very funny. For those unfamiliar with Wayne Brown, he's the current mayor of Auckland. But to, but to this lecturer, ideas do not stand or fall on their own merits. Instead, he can dismiss arguments he disagrees with simply by impugning the character of the person who proposes them, using the logical fa fallacy of argumentum ab, ab honomen, rather ad honomen. Homen. Uh, to this lecturer, describing Wayne Brown as a narcissist who is, quote-unquote, full of shit, is acceptable discourse in an academic environment and a valid rebuttal of the mayor's arguments. Enough about Wayne. <laughs> um, but I just thought I'd get that in there. So there we have it. This lecture reflects the caliber of academic instruction at Auckland University. This crude propaganda is what qualifies as acceptable scholarly standards at Auckland University. I posed a number of questions to the academic who delivered this lecture and afforded him a right of, re of reply. I specifically asked if he would provide a guarantee to the students who raised concerns about the material and how it was presented that they would not face academic sanction or lose their places at Auckland University. He refrained from providing such an assurance, offering instead the response that he stands by all comments he made in this lecture. He stands by the comments he made in this lecture. Kids, film your teachers. Students, film your professors. Publish the footage or give it to me and I'll do it for you. You deserve a quality education and you're only going to get it if you demand it. The way to liberate our academic institutions from far left propaganda and indoctrination like this is to expose it. Thank you for tuning in to Simon TV, everyone. See you next time.